great. Okay, so George Fodor's misguided line unit. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'll try not to read my slides entirely, but it's there because I know I talk very fast. And I hope you're not irritated by the indentations. Uh, they're supposed to make it easier to read the slide quickly. There, I put them into chunks, the readable chunks. I hope it makes it, it helps you. Uh, we're not hearing you. We know you're saying something. Oh, the mic. Put it higher. So we are Is that better? Is it? We're not understanding. Yes. Oh, <laughs> that's why I have it printed because I speak too fast. And I, and I think I speak slowly, but people tell me otherwise. Right? Okay, is that better? Yes, yes. Okay, good. Um, anyway, I, I hope you're not irritated by the indentations. They're supposed to be helpful, <laughs> and I hope you, they are as you get used to it. <clears throat> We're all, of course, indebted to Fodor for his many seminal ideas regarding the mind. But besides the flow of ideas, one thing I miss most, and I really do miss it, is his no notoriously energetic argumentative style. There was often, maybe not always, as much fun and profit in disagreeing with him as in agreeing. Today I'll focus on some of our disagreements, not meaning to diminish in the slightest of the extent of my sympathies. In writing my memoir of him last year, which is now in mind and language if you're interested, um, <clears throat> I was struck by the central role that Quine's confirmation holism, what I'll call confirm holism, uh, played in his views in opposing analyticity, uh, roughly speaking truth by meaning of the words, I linger on the definition of analyticity. I take it you all know the rough intuition, you know, like bachelors are unmarried and squares are four-sided. Uh, you know, both in opposing analyticity and conceptual role semantics, CR semantics, you know, the meaning of a term is its role in, you know, with other terms inside your psychology, and in his mad dog nativism, all simple concepts are innate along the lines Eric discussed earlier, and, his, and in his skepticism about a computational theory of central cognition. This explained his, for me, unnerving claim, quote, I often have the feeling I'm just saying what Quine would have said, but for his empiricism, unquote. Confirm holism is actually associated by Fodor and many others <clears throat> with four very different claims that Quine made in his very famous influential 1953 article, Two Dogmas of Empiricism. Uh, these claims are actually logically independent and deserve separate discussion. First is the confirmation holism, uh, uh, confirm holism statement uh, claim itself, the famous you know, line that you know, uh, is always repeated uh, from Quine's 1953, our beliefs confront the tribunal of experience only as a corporate body. Uh, the second, the revisability claim, every belief is revisable in the light of experience. Three, a really quite separate issue uh, about physical reductionism. Intentional terms, you know, terms of, you know, regarding meaning, concepts, and the like, <clears throat> must be definable non-circularly in non-intentional terms. Right? You reduce to physical terms. And four, an explanatory claim. There's no explanatory difference between analytic claims and common tenacious beliefs. The example I'll discuss has been much discussed in the literature. Right, uh, Gerald Katz thought cats are animals is analytic, and Hillary Putnam said, no, it's not because we could discover their robots from Mars. And so the question is, huh, right, who's right? Is it analytic or is it just a common biological belief? I'll discuss that in due course. I don't want to argue today that any of these claims is actually false. I think they all are, actually. But my concern today is only to deny that they support Quine's and Fodor's skepticism about the analytic and a conceptual role of semantics. I'll not discuss the other supposed consequences, you know, nativism and uh, the impossibility of a computational theory of central cognition. Lastly, I will suggest that Fodor's own positive views about meaning, his asymmetric dependence, and intentional content would fare much better without them. Okay, firstly, confirmation holism. Our beliefs confront the tribunal of experience only as a corporate body. 
This is a view that Quine derived from uh, Pierre Duhaime's uh, 1914 observation that in empirical sciences, hypotheses are not disconfirmed or confirmed in isolation, but only in conjunction with a great number of auxiliary hypotheses and background beliefs. I, I take it this is a fam view familiar to most of you. What Quine importantly adds to Duhaime, you know, which it's interesting to imagine what Duhaime would have made of it, uh, is the claim that uh, it involves all of our beliefs, including logic, math, and analytic claims, which in fact would seem to be disconfirmed independently in the, of experience. Quine never provides a serious argument for this extension, nor does he spell out in any detail how it could function. At best, he appeals to five virtues of hypotheses, as he calls them, simplicity, generality, modesty, conservatism, falsifiability, that he and Joseph Ullian set out in a freshman text you know, on uh, introductory philosophy. Uh, these are good rules of thumb, right? But they're hardly a serious theory. In fact, when Quine was chided about this uh, in, uh, uh, in discussions in the 80s, he actually wrote, oh, I treated it mainly at this very general level because I, I have known little to say of it that was not common knowledge. Okay. That was his only defense and you know, as much detail as he provided about these virtues and his uh, global conference holism. But it's hard to see why this common knowledge should have anything to do with ruling out the analytic. For surely we at least commonly suppose that confirmation preserves meaning. Observing a thousand flying sparrows had better not be your evidence that pigs can fly, simply because you've decided to let the word pigs mean sparrows. Moreover, Jerry argued in his, in his famous 2000 book, The Mind Doesn't Work That Way, that if Quine is right, confirmation is uncomputable since, as Turing taught us, computation is a local affair. Of course, Jerry thought Quine was right, and so he did a modus ponens and derived the consequent that computation, you know, that uh, uh, com confirmation is uncomputable. But one could, of course, take it as a modus tollens and conclude that the Quinean account therefore can't be right, and that indeed the mind doesn't work that way, the way that Quine said it did. Anyway, all I actually want to claim now is that that's a wide open question. You know, I think it's really important to realize that sometimes passing appearances of the contrary, nobody has a clue exactly how we confirm a hypothesis. It's a really interesting, deep question. Is you know, how do scientists and even in common sense do you confirm your hypotheses about the ordinary world? Whether it's holistic as Quine proposed, or it you know, uh, involves uh, presuming logic and mathematics as Bayesians uh, suppose. Lovely question. It's not going to be settled simply by philosophical reflection. <clears throat> Fodor actually thought of confirmation holism in a curious way. This is a quote from his and Ernie's book, and I actually don't know whether this is Fodor's view or Ernie's view, and he can speak, right? right? Or maybe it was his. <clears throat> uh, uh, it is a posteriori, or an empirical matter, of what is in fact causally connected to what in the world, not a matter to be settled by a priori reason, least of all by reflection on the meanings of one's words or concepts. But if that's the view, that's confused. As Donald Davidson famously noted in his 1963 action, paper, Action, Reasons, and Causes, causation is a relation between events, not concepts. And a, ca a cause of x caused x is surely a priori, if anything is, okay? even if it's an empirical issue, just what that cause might be. Empirical relations among events don't preclude analytic connections between the terms that describe them. So it's just, you know, it's a mistaken right, a confusion, uh, and it's certainly a mistake to confuse that with confirmation holism. I think what Jerry really had more in mind was a second view Quine associated with confirm holism, namely revisability. All beliefs about the world, including logic, math, and supposed analytic truths, are revisable in the light of experience. Now, this certainly seemed to tell against uh, at least a simple verifications theory of meaning that was really one of the major uh, targets of Quine's attack in the 1953 article. That's really what you know, his, his, one of his two dogmas of empiricism that he was attacking. 
You shouldn't tie any claim to any specific verification since, to put in a nutshell, who knows what tomorrow's researches might bring. But verificationism isn't the only theory of meaning. And as Fodor and Ernie have pointed out, it's hard to take Quine's claims about revision seriously without some account of meaning. Quote, it's no news that you could hold on to burning is, I should, should be the burning is the liberation of phlogiston in the face of Lavoisier's result if it means gray cat has whiskers. Okay. Again, you've got to keep meaning constant, both in the Holism case and in the revisability case, if you're to make the, uh, uh, the proposals make any sense. <clears throat> Moreover, Quine truly means something more than banal fallibilism. Experience could show we're wrong about anything, doing sums or using our words. Clearly what Quine intended, and I mean, this is an interesting uh, you know, suggestion he made, you know, he intended is that any belief can be rationally revised, right? <clears throat> both in the case of belief revision, but also in holistic confirmation. So you're supposed to, you know, he's imagining that you can do this rationally. By the way, it's really important in thinking about Quine I mean, to remember that he actually has a very unusual view that almost nobody takes seriously. But he did. Okay. For him, belief wasn't what you think it is, right? Namely, you know, the state of mind. A, a belief was not what you ordinarily think it is, namely a state that combines with other beliefs to you know, re fat patterns of reasoning. Belief with him, for him was a disposition to say yes or no to certain you know, phonemic sequences. <laughs> he was deeply, and I think, if I may say this, intelligently and sort of scrupulously, he tried to be a behaviorist. <laughs> and there's a way in which he's charming because he pursues it to its bizarre end. But I think most people who read two dogmas don't realize that and they don't notice right, the oddity of some of his views. <clears throat> uh, but so I'm not concerned though with Quine. I just want to say, you know, it sounds like I'm making Quine out to be an idiot, but in fact, you know, he's completely consistent because he's a behaviorist, right? <clears throat> But anyway, uh, if, he does, if it is a matter of rational revision, we are owed some account of the standards of reason and how they might be applied to mere sentences, mere strings of phonemes for Quine, that don't have specific meanings. Since notoriously, rational inductions, uh, for example, can't be spelled out purely syntactically. In sum, Quine's appeals to confirm holism and to revisability both presuppose the reality of meanings and so don't undermine it, right, the reality of meanings, as Quine thought. And Fodor seemed to agree, at least about the analytic. But two other of Quine's uh, claims influenced Jerry. Reductionism. Quine famously considered, uh, in that article, ways of defining analyticity, exploring plausible explanations in terms of synonymy, definition, intention, possibility, and contradiction. He pointed out that each notion stands in as much need of explanation as analyticity itself. The notion form a closed curve in space, as he put it. This worry gave rise to two to three, two to three generations of philosophers either trying to break out of the intentional circle, attempting to provide naturalistic reductions of intentional to non-intentional, e.g. physical notions, as in the work of Fred Dretzky, Jerry, Ruth Millikan, Karen Neander, or, to my mind more problematically, despairing of breaking out of it at all and concluding, therefore, that intentional talk should be relegated to a second grade instrumentalist normative status. That's the conclusion that Quine himself drew on page 221 of Word and Object, a very famous passage. Uh, and you find that in Quine, and Davidson, and Frankie Egan, and Chomsky, and quite a few other, other uh, uh, philosophers of the last 50 years. But these responses, it's, I actually was under the spell of this you know, reductionism myself until recently when I just thought, wait a minute, right? this is odd because these responses fly in the face of technical work of Frank Ramsey that's very well known in the field in the 1920s, and it was souped up by David Lewis in the 1970s, called Ramsification. I won't go into the details now, I just, you know, it's a, essentially, you know, a way whereby one can f formally define many theoretical notions all at once, as in Shoemaker's Phyllis's phrase, package deals. 
you simply take the whole theory and you one by one say, look, right, you know, the, the, the meaning of, of you know, electron, positron, pi meson, and so forth, they're all defined together as a whole package deal. It's a theory of physics, right? <clears throat> it's, it's actually a, a nice memory I have of learning this because in high school, when after my physics teacher, you know, we went through weeks and weeks of all the laws of electromagnetism, you know, I being a, you know, a, <coughs> Uh, irrepressible philosopher said, yes, yes, that's very nice, Mr. Koenig, but what is, what is electricity? And he looked at me blankly and said, I just told you. Do right? you want me to go over the theory again? <laughs> right? And I, I was really a moment of illumination. I said, oh my god, that's right. See, I guess you could define it in just implicit, as I say, implicitly, in terms of the whole theory you've been provided. Uh, the acceptability of any one term, dep depending on the explanatory power of the containing theory as a whole. In the case of psychological terms, one should look for their adequate definition via ultimate theories of the mental processes that use them and ramsify away, as one says. I mean, ramsify has kind of become a verb now in philosophical English. But psychological uh, theories are hardly in a state to do this yet. And so what's the rush? Whether the definitions are ultimately satisfactory depends on whether those ultimate theories are. And we're not in a state right, to do, decide on the ultimate theories of psychology by any means. Why shouldn't meaning and other intentional notions be ultimately defined in this way, just as Fodor and other functionalists proposed defining other mental terms like belief and desire? The intentional circle had been noted in the 40s, and, you know, probably not sorry, in the 50s and 60s, as yeah, there being a, a circle who tried to try to belief in terms of you know, non-physically you'd have to use desire, and desire would have to involve belief. They noticed, yeah, it was a package deal, right? And my claim is, yeah, why not include intentional notions you know, with a package? Quine's reduction challenge to meaning, therefore, amounts to little more than skepticism about intentional mentalistic theories as a whole, which is fine. I mean, yeah, he was skeptical because he thought he had a better theory, Skinnerian behaviorism. Okay? And, you know, I mean, to his credit, he really tried, he really thought that, and he tried to work it out for better or worse. Needless to say, that was not a view shared by Jerry. But though Jerry was also too much under the spell of the reductionist challenge, he reasonably thought that Quine presented a further challenge to at least analyticities and conceptual role meanings that went beyond behaviorism. And I think he was right in this. This is the last, I think it's really the most important of Quine's challenges, namely an explanatory challenge. What is the best explanation of phenomena that seem to invite conceptual role meanings and the analytic? The analytic was originally recruited by the logical positivists to explain knowledge of logic, mathematics, and philosophical analyses. And Quine, both in his 1953, but his much, much better paper, Carnap and Logical Truth in 1956, uh, which everyone should read. It's a classic. It's one of Quine's best papers. Uh, he raised lots of arguments that gave at least positivism pause, right? Really are knocked down, really incisive arguments against the logical positivists' uh, proposals. In a nutshell, Quine argued there's no explanatory difference between analytic claims and common tenacious beliefs. Uh, I'll repeat now the example I've already discussed. To take a famous example that was disputed by Hilary Putnam and Gerald Katz in the journals in the 1980s, I think it was. Is cats or animals analytic a priori, as Gerald Katz insisted? Or is it empirical, as Putnam claimed, argument would be false if it turned out the furry things were robots? Which left it an issue of biology, not semantics, and it left many Quanians wondering who cared and what the difference amounted to. But leave aside the philosophers. Linguists are interested in explaining what speakers find peculiarly unacceptable, indicated by stars, for example, and these are syntactic examples, who did Mary Ann go to the movies, right? For Mary and Jim went to the movies, you can't ask the question, who did Mary Ann go to the movies? Or who did pictures of scare Mary? You know, pictures of Kant scare Mary. Uh, but you can't ask the question that way. Linguists claim these cases are explained by syntactic rules of the, what they call I language, or the internal language. Not the external language of English, but the computational system responsible for your grammatical competence. Many linguists think there's, there's something also in the I language that would explain why speakers would reject literal readings of 
Holmes killed Sykes, but Sykes isn't dead. John sold a car, but no one bought it. Colorless green numbers ate petulantly, to change the usual example. <laughs> Uh, for example, uh, the, you know, the claim was that these violate some sort of eye semantic constraints. Okay? That killing is linked to causing the die somehow, selling to buying, green to color, and so forth. Call these the analytic data. They're just, you know, like the syntactic data that, uh, <coughs> uh, on which uh, uh, Chomskyans routinely rely uh, in their theory theories of grammar, uh, these are just more such data where people have an odd response and you want to figure out how. Why are they having that odd response? Uh, even if it's far trickier to isolate the intuitions in these cases from their expressions of mere belief. Quine doesn't seriously try to explain such analytic data, making only a perfunctory appeal to what he calls centrality. You know, uh, he thinks of your, you know, of your beliefs, <laughs> Yeah, they form this network of dispositions to assent and dissent, to say yes or no, strings of phonemes. Uh, you know, it's a vast, vast web, and that's all there is, because we don't look inside. We don't look inside how, you, how you're you know, processing or doing with these sentences. You just have these dispositions, and they can vary you know, as you get bombarded with experience, right? You'll change. Things will, you'll, you'll see some blue canaries, and suddenly we'll revise. Canaries are yellow. Um, uh, and he thought that was the whole story. That's all we could say. It was right, in the face of experience, you change your dispositions to assent and dissent. <clears throat> the appearance of sentences being analytic is due to their being comparatively central, uh, and so are given up only under it would or would be given up only under extreme pressure from the peripheral forces of experience. So it's just because you know, Bachelors are unmarried is so central to our beliefs that you know we don't we won't give it up. But this explanation won't do. Centrality and the appearance of analyticity don't seem to be at all so closely related. The world has existed for more than two minutes. All animals are mortal, are central, right? I can't imagine really giving them up, but don't seem the least analytic. Okay? And many standard examples of what seem analytic don't seem remotely central. Bachelors are unmarried and aunts or sisters are of no central importance and could easily be revised if someone really cared but didn't mind changing their meaning. <laughs> Far from unrevisability explaining analyticity, it would seem to be analyticity that explains unrevisability. The only reason one balks at denying aunts or sisters is, is, is that that's just what aunt means. Jerry noticed this the problem, but merely replied, <clears throat> quote, no doubt intuitions deserve respect. But intuitions of conceptual connectedness can plausibly be explained away by appealing to some mixture of centrality and factor X. And as far as I know, there is nothing in philosophy aside from these raw intuitions that seriously suggests that content constituting conceptual connections exist. Jerry provided uh, many, over the years, many uh, suggestions about what factor X might be. Uh, they were Caterus Paribus conditions. They had to do with syntactic structure, I think. Um, uh, uh, <coughs> uh, Eric went over a number of the suggestions today. I think it was Eric. Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, in the most recent work with Zen and uh, Kalishin, uh, these so-called halos. I don't want to go through each of his suggestions. I don't find them, you know, very many of them very convincing at all. Uh, in, but in any case, I thought for such an empirical question, okay, you know, empirical questions are all fours with other questions that linguists ask about, ask about our unacceptability reactions. You wonder why Jerry left it to philosophy to provide it. Indeed, I'm surprised that Jerry never took up a suggestion of Chomsky that goes way back to 1954 and his terrific LSLT, you know, the Logical Structure of Linguistic Theory, which he wrote in 1955. Um, as well, and then he reiterated in many papers in the 90s that were gathered together in the 2000 volume, that treats the meaning issues that concern linguistics as not determining reference and truth conditions at all, much less truth by virtue of meaning. They serve rather merely as instructions, uh, sorry, it would be instructions to the I language, uh, sorry, no, instructions that the I language makes available to our conceptual system when it turns that faculty to express thoughts. So the idea is you've got this I language in there and it produces lots of structures, right? And oh yeah, we're you know, smart people and we say, huh, that's nice, I can use that to express my thoughts and communicate my thoughts. 
Um, and it's that use, right? It's the use of those structures made available by the I language that gives us um, <coughs> uh, tokens of sentences, if you like, right? Uh, <coughs> that uh, have reference and truth conditions. But you shouldn't think of the I language itself as producing the uh, items with the, the properties of reference and truth conditions by themselves. Of course, as those here at Rutgers likely know well, Paul Petrovsky, in a series of, I think, extremely uh, nice works uh, from beginning in 2005, has been developing the suggestion for some decades now, as have many others in their own ways, analogous ways. For example, Sperber and Wilson, going back to 1986, Robin Carson, and Francois Reconati. They're variants of a, a similar idea. <coughs> Of course, Jerry, like Quine, would have wondered what distinguishes a rule, treat Fs as G, <coughs> uh, that's an I language instruction, from simply an entrenched belief that all Fs are G. Now, I don't pretend to have a full reply, but I do think what it lays, uh, can at least lay out a strategy for a reply, or anyway, a suggestion about where to look, specifically to Jerry's own asymmetric dependency account of content. Roughly, and I developed this at greater length in my book, forthcoming. Um, <clears throat> but roughly, a symbol has the content it does if the non-content determined tokenings of it asymmetrically depend upon the content determined ones. E.g., calling John a bachelor depends upon calling unmarried males bachelors, but not vice versa. You could stop calling John a bachelor, but still use it to describe unmarried males. This is not the place to spell out the details of the highly qualified version of the view that I defend, except to point out that freed from the quining insistence on reduction that haunted Jerry, and integrated shamelessly into the rest of an intentionalistic psychology, it seems to me to be offer a strategy for replying to the Quinean challenge along the following lines. Let's suppose, per the suggestion of Chomsky and Petrovsky, <coughs> that uses of a word with a specific meaning asymmetrically depend on the I language instructions contained in its lexical entry. On how I understand their view, mere instructions simply provide, as I understand it, and they all can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, simply provide default constraints on usage. Uh, I like the analogy with morality. Just as someone can take fully seriously prohibitions against killing, while still thinking it's OK to kill in self-defense, so can someone use a word with its meaning, even if it doesn't always abide by the relevant instructions. Note in both cases, the person could recognize the problem in doing so, and therefore think that justification is required. So if I think that you know, killing is wrong, well, if I do kill in self-defense, I, yeah, I understand. Yeah, I'm violating the prohibition, but I think it's overridden by the fall, and I'll justify it. And similarly, if I think cats are, you know, if I find out the cats are robots, I'll say, yeah, yeah, I found out the cats are robots. I understand that cats are animals is you know, part of the instructions of my eye language, but I think I'm going to override it for the following you know, you know, scientific reasons. <clears throat> After all, we are not slaves to our eye language and are free to use the expressions of I language to express and communicate thoughts in a context as needs be. Uh, a point that you know, Paul makes with many, many examples, uh, but you, you know, most familiar to most people with discussions of polysemy and so-called Travis cases. You know, the example, the kettle is black is said of one bought that's bought black, or of a red one that you left on the stove all night. <coughs> so you get different truth conditions. <coughs> Consider again, I hope mean, this is the final time, the, the cats put in dispute about cats. Maybe for some reason our animals got baked into speaker's eye language instruction for cats. Okay. By the way, I should tell you, I myself don't have you know, the deepest and firmest intuitions about the analytic and aesthetic. I think they're quite subtle and difficult to sort out. And I don't trust my, you know, just immediate intuitions. But I, I see the pattern, right? And I think there's something to it that needs to be explained. So I'm not standing by the cats or animals, but you know, there was Gerald Katz, you know, arguing to the uh, to the wall uh, that um, uh, animals was part of the meaning of the word cats. Um, so maybe for some reasons, our an you know, some reason our animals got baked into speaker's eye language instruction for cats, giving rise to intuitions that cats or animals is analytic. Does that mean that confronted with Putnam's robot cats, we have to deny this? No, 
we can say that experience suggests that cats aren't animals despite their eye semantics, just as killing was all right in self-defense. Eye semantic instructions can be real, but overridden by other considerations, e.g. that what we've been calling cats turn out to have been robots, or more usually by scientific advances about the nature of things. Thus, cats and Putnam could both be right, i.e. a sentence might be analytic and false. Although if it's true, then maybe it could be known just by knowing the meanings of the words. I won't you know, insist on that now, but it seems to me that's a strategy someone could, could uh, defend. <clears throat> this might be disappointing to the logical positivists who wanted inconvertible knowledge of logic and mathematics, but it still might perform the linguistic work of explaining analytical intuitions, analytic intuitions, better than either Klein or Jerry did. But in a way that Jerry, with his asymmetric dependencies, should have otherwise welcomed. Freed from the Quinean demand for a reduction of the intentional and taken inside and treated as a clause in otherwise explanatory psychology, Jerry's asymmetric dependencies offers a promising strategy for replying to Quine's challenge. I should say, I mean, I didn't want to go into detail here. Uh, this suggestion, um, it's interesting, the history here, uh, uh, you know, Jerry proposed the asymmetric dependency in 1987 and developed it further in his 1990 book. Uh, and then quite independently, someone who one wouldn't associate with Jerry remotely, um, uh, you know, a much more uh, Wittgensteinian sort of conceptual role theorist, Paul Horwich, he made essentially the same suggestion in his 1998 book, uh, Meaning, and uh, followed it by his 2006 book, I think it is, um, uh, Reflections on Meaning, where he says, yeah, the uh, meaning constitutive conditions are the ones that are explanatory basic on which the other ones depend. Okay? So uh, in my book, I try to work out you know, a, a version of, that combines both Horwich's and Jerry's views. Uh, and I think you know, what I argue is that that offers a promising strategy for replying to Klein's challenge about how to distinguish <coughs> uh, analytic claims from mere common beliefs. Or anyway, so I argue in my forthcoming book. But that is mercifully a topic for another day. This is all for now. I must say, though, I do wish Jerry were here to reply. Chairs or idea, right? 
Now, of course, what you, you know, what you want to say about Barclay is, look, he was no dope. He was a very smart man. He's an ingenious, he gives an ingenious argument, an ingenious justification for why chairs are ideas, right? He's got the concepts. He knows what the, as it were, default settings on chair and idea are. He's just overriding them with a Pacamini theory, right? Um, contrast that with, a, as it were, a naive foreigner or some child who, for some reason, got to his head that the word chair just sort of meant chair appearance or something. And he thought, well, you couldn't have chair appearances without a perceiver. And so he winds up, you know, saying things like Barclay that you want to say, oh, look, he's just misunderstood the language. Okay. You see that? So that's the distinction I want to make. That's helpful. Good. Thanks. Yeah? So great talk. Um, uh, could you say a little bit more about how the confrontation between empirical discovery and high language um, stipulation uh, goes? I mean, does the high language stipulation say something like, don't call something a cat unless you're going to call it an animal? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know exactly the form of the instructions. I'll defer to Paul about that. But I'm just suggesting, suppose it went that way. Suppose it went the way of saying, look, the word cat has baked into it this you know, uh, uh, information about it being an animal. Fine, let that be the instruction. That gets sent, and you say, oh yeah, cat, uh, yeah cat's an animal word, okay? Uh, and so you use it that way, that's the default setting. But then, you know, you find out they're robots, and uh, you realize that you have larger justificational issues at, at stake here. And so you override the default. You say, my language got, it's just wrong, okay? I mean, why, why wouldn't, um, uh, why, why wouldn't the I language instruction be overwritten? I mean, sorry, why wouldn't that override the empirical discovery? So, you know, it says, you know, don't, don't call something a cat unless you're willing to call it an animal. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so I find out that um, these things um, uh, are machines. Yeah. So why, why would that be? Yeah, look, I don't think I, ha I have or there could be as a very general a, a contextual reply to that. Okay. Uh, how you think we should speak, right? Should we go on speaking about cats, you know, even though they turned out to be robots? Uh, or should we just simply say there are no cats? Uh, it seems to me, uh, uh, you know, it depends upon, as it were, the contextual, communicative, scientific, you know, situation you're in to see what would be the best way to proceed. I, I actually myself am sympathetic to Putnam's suggestion. Yeah, we just turn out like you know, cats are animals, even though I understand, I would understand and kind of flinch right at this funny use of the word cats. Right, I'd simply say, yeah, but it's overridden. I have better pragmatic conceptual reasons to think that cats are you know are robots. But you could go by the way, and you could be conservative about the language. It says, no, no, there are no cats. Um, yeah, I mean, but if I mean, couldn't Klein say, well, it'll always go that way, and, and that's what my unreliability thesis says, man. Well, he could. I mean, you could say that, but I mean, I don't think it's true. I think many of us could be persuaded by that in this, you know, reasoning and say, "Oh yeah, you know, cats are robots." No, I mean, and even though, even though I recognize that you know, uh, 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 animals is part of the I instruction. But I mean, for, if, if it always went the way uh, Putnam says it does, in, in that case, I mean, couldn't Klein say that he was vindicated? Um, um, there still be, see, there would still be, as it were, a linguistic fact. Is it part of the I language instructions? You know, that you know, animals is baked into cat. Okay. That seems to be just a, a fact, and maybe it is. Uh, it, it's a fact to be discovered or, or disconfirmed by linguists, not by Klein. Okay. Um, that's where the fact of the matter seems to be to reside about whether it's analytic or not. Okay. Whether it's true or not, right, depends upon how you're going to you know, use that sentence you know, in your subsequent you know, science and communication. So yeah, I don't see how the crime would be vindicated um, because. Well, it's just I mean, if, if there's when there's a confrontation between the empirical discovery and the I language instruction, the empirical discovery always wins. Um, I don't know. Is that true? I didn't say it. No, I, I said. Know, I, know, I, know, I know, but I'm just saying quite, I mean, Oh, if it did. It seems like you, know, you need to give us some reason to think that that won't always happen because if it does, uh, then it seems like crime is vindicated. I'm sorry, I'm putting that more. Yeah. Well, I guess what, you know, I guess what I want to say is this: I don't see any reason that I should you know, allow either language to always trump my conceptual system or my conceptual system always to trump language. It seems to be a kind of, if you like, pragmatic issue depending upon the communicative purposes, you know, scientific purposes that are, you know, at issue. And I could go either way. As I say, I could, you know, when I read the Katz-Putnam debate, I can feel fooled both ways. 
And they're going to say, it just depends on what further considerations, how it's going to integrate with the rest of your biology, what are you going to say about respiration and metabolism. I don't know. There might be all sorts of theoretical considerations to either say, no, we've got to get rid of the cats and animals, we're going to screw up our biology too much. Maybe that would be right, in which case, fine. Oh, there are no cats. Or maybe it wouldn't, depending upon, maybe they have artificial respiration and artificial metabolism, blah, blah, blah. And you say, oh, yeah, look, so many of the generalizations are preserved, you know, that cats just turn out to be robots. Again, it really depends upon all these other considerations of which word meaning would typically be one. Yeah? the sentence, bachelors are male. Hubbard <coughs> uh, describes it one way in his famous article, I don't know if you find that all bachelors have a certain erotic right, syndrome, and you know, so many of them do that you, know, you now let the, the word bachelor migrate to this natural kind of neurosis. It's a kind of you know, preposterous example, but I see his drift, right? That, <coughs> yeah, you could be pushed right, to say, yeah, all bachelors are neurotic, so that turn out to be some um, um, Married bachelors, in that case, because they have the neurotic symptoms or something. Um, uh, you can imagine a bunch of stories like that that would you know, push us. It's like the robots, you know, uh, cats are robots case. But now imagine a different kind of case. Uh, uh, as, uh, someone concerned, concerned about uh, gender bias might think that bachelor um, uh, shouldn't be confined only to uh, men. It's just invidious you know, comparison, whatever. And they might say, look, we really ought to use the word bachelor both for men and women, okay? unmarried men and unmarried women. Fine. My, my guess is that would be, as it were, a, you know, if you're actually re recommending you have a new lexical item now, you know, bachelor meaning male or female, fine. That would be a, a semantic change. And I, you, I think there's intuitively a clear, a clear difference between the two kinds of cases. One's pushed by scientific considerations, and the other simply by verbal considerations. Yeah? So I'm wondering, so Katz used to say stuff like the, um, the um, Type intention for cat is going to be like the animals, but the type extension, my sorry, the token extension in the Putnam scenario, yeah, to and so uh, to, to you know these robots, yeah. And so what does the difference amount to then on your view? Because you have this baked, this idea of being baked in, but it's overridden by yeah. these contextual considerations. But the cats could have said the same thing. Um, it's interesting. I hadn't, I hadn't actually thought about that specific question and you know, whether, how would cats react to the proposals I'm making. He doesn't, I think, make the kind of you know the Chomsky move here, distinguishing right high language semantics from truth conditions and reference. A lovely question. Uh, can I just you know I need to do more cat scholarship to figure out how exactly you know he might reply and how intention would be attached. I guess he thought intentions were attached to lexical item types, okay? Um, and I, would, you know, I guess on this view, think that's too strong. You know, you know, what gets attached to lexical item type are simply instructions. You get a full intention with truth conditions and so forth only after the conceptual system decides not to use this linguistic structure by one way or another. But nice question. I haven't thought about that yet. Yeah, Paul. Um, so just one thing fast, right? I myself wouldn't want to talk about default instructions or begging cat in. Oh, okay. but, but, but I can certainly see how that kind of views might go. Yeah. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you for the thing I did want to ask, though, is um, just about the notion of analyticity we're after, right? I, I, I worry a bit about building too much around the positivist conception of analyticity, which seems to me like, okay, it was a bonkers notion um, and it worked, worked well to have rid of it. Um, there was the older idea of analyticity. You were distinguishing the analytic a priori from the synthetic a priori. Yeah. Yes, fact, good, good. In fact, you thought 
it is important to yes. distinguish multiple flavors yes. of propositions known a priori. Yes. Um, analytic was then to cash down kind of notion of entertainment. Yes, absolutely. Right? Yes. And so that in fact was really going to be important things like every uh, dog bark loudly implies every brown dog barked. Yeah. And that in fact the entertainment relations were related to the quantifiers, right? And you know, there's lots of stuff in medieval logic that's all about this. Good. Um, Good. And if that's what we're trying to get at with the notion of analyticity, then um, it might be quite important to say, um, well, you know, there's logic, there's arithmetic, yeah. um, and within logic, there's classical logic, and like sort of the outer reaches. And so, you know, this might be sympathetic with what you're, the, the general spirit, that it would then be an empirical question um, to think about how much that we now regard as the a priori broadly construed, and even how much would we now regard as logic, so to say, when you're having a discussion with Dan, how much of that really deserves to be called analytic in any kind of natural containment sense? Spot on. I, you know, and I, I'm sorry if I've got your own view wrong about the instructions. You can correct me about that later. Um, but you, you agree this is a possible view. It's not a possible um, But uh, I like your second question. I've been thinking about it quite independently of this lecture. Uh, that, you know, because I, I really have a lot of admiration for Kant. Uh, and I'm thinking, what is he getting at? What is he getting at? And as um, John McFarlane pointed out uh, in, a, in a lovely article uh, about 10 years ago, uh, you know, it's not clear that Frege really refuted Kant because, you know, Kant thought it was sort of true by logic and containment. I mean, you know, these simple analytic truths. And when Frege comes out with logic, wow, it's a lot more powerful than containment. And it's, it's you know, second order logic with all sorts of very powerful principles that gives you an infinitude, it generates an potential infinitude of, of, of logical truths. And as McFarland points out, crime of the thought, that's pretty synthetic, right? I mean, you're using your imagination to synthesize more and more complex structures. I'm very sympathetic to that. I think that's, yeah, I think Kant was insightful about you know, a, a, an issue here. I'm not quite sure how to spell it out in the end. But that's an insightful distinction. And so, yes, I would say the analytic truths are simply ones you could spell out by you know, some kind of containment. I think Gerald Katz actually has that view, too, if I, uh, if I remember right. You know, he says that Kant was right about containment and not just about logical consequence. I mean, just any logical consequence. So that's right. And then I'd like to say, yeah, so it turns out that you know, it's more complicated than Frege and positivist thought. That it may well be that part of our a priori knowledge is synthetic, has to do with the principle by which our mind combines ideas uh, in certain necessary ways, maybe. Uh, and the analytic is only a tiny subset having to do with the instructions of the language faculty. But nice point, thank you. Yeah? So in the cases where we. Could you speak a little louder? Sorry, yeah, sure. In the cases where. Mm -hmm. Are those all cases where, uh, is it possible to keep the same term but change the instruction? Yeah. Or, yeah. Okay. That's what I was thinking about with the bachelor example. I was thinking that you could revise bachelors or, or mail in two different ways. You could do it because of a funny Tuckman scenario of finding out there's the nearest natural kind of neurotics, right? that turned out to have some married people in them. Um, <clears throat> or you could do it because you think as a matter of policy, we don't have a new lexical item. Instead of using this old lexical item, which was gender coded, right, bachelor for male, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> uh, or male for bachelor, right, uh, we should use a, another lexical item, bachelor. You know, we should use the same homological form, but now, you know. That's um, the case I was clear about. So yeah. then you're, you're introducing a new term. It's not held hostage. That's right. Yeah. 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 It just becomes a new lexical item in your own language. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. then the, the, the former I language rules don't apply to that's that, right. right? But well, what about in other cases where, no, we're using the same term, it's just now there's a real shift in the I language or something, that instruction. Yeah, well, that depends on how you're going to individuate the lexical items. And offhand, I, you know, I'd be sympathetic offhand <laughs> to thinking you individual the lexical items by the set of instructions, right? By syntactic and, and semantic combinatorics, right? That's what identifies the lexical item. If you change that, you got a new lexical item. I mean, why? Because that's what the theory is talking about. It's talking about lexical items and you know, how they combine. Uh, nice question. Yeah, uh, let's see. If somebody hasn't had a chance. Yeah. So when people, like Chomsky especially, talk about like I language instruction concepts, uh, 
he often uses that to actually undermine the idea of truth conditional semantics in general. And well, I know in general, at least, yeah. yeah he's he's skeptical is. maybe further about pragmatics and truth conditional semantics, but at least at this point, uh, uh, one could be neutral about that and say, I'm just separating the work of well, the I'm language. Not sure you, I'm not sure that you can because, you know, I kind of, the, a lot of the kind of program of this kind of natural language metaphysics involves taking the I language instructions as involving these kind of sort of patently false but cognitively useful um, ways of thinking about the world that, you know, when I serve dinner at six o'clock, the event is instantaneous, or when uh, I rearrange the furniture in the room, the furniture is infinitely divisible stuff. And that sort of these conceptual instructions don't actually, aren't intended and don't work to kind of ground out in empirical inquiry of the kind that kind of uh, well, right. Okay. Look, right. I'm not sure about your examples. I, mean, I find them a little startling, but but fine. Uh, uh, suppose you were right. Uh, the I language instruction had some really batty, right, you know, uh, uh, conditions baked in. Uh, fine. You know, our intelligent adult selves would say, huh, yeah, we got these items. It's a little like the sky is blue. I mean, my, one of my favorite examples. Where, you know, what the hell are you talking about? This thing, what's this thing, the sky? Yeah, but my language talks about. Oh, the wind blew the. You know, you know, blew the. Or down. Well, it did blow the way a wolf does, but, uh, but fine. I noticed with some, maybe some bemusement what my eye language, you know, supplies to me, and I just say, yes, screw it. I mean, <laughs> I don't know, I'm a slave to it. It's interesting what my eye language, uh, my eye language has me do all sorts of things. I can't say who, you know, who did the picture of Scare Mary. I know exactly what I would mean if I said it, but okay, my eye language just says, no, 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 you can't say it that way. Okay, okay. Uh, maybe I'll even adopt the practice of saying it that way if I could. Um, depending, right? So I'm not a slave to my high language. If my high language tells me batty things, which it might well do, I'm free to ignore it. I mean, I'm free to ignore it while still maybe saying, I'm still using that lexical item though, and I feel the pull, I see, you know, and in, in communication, I may mean, think, yeah, I'm using that lexical item because I know that's the one you have, so I'm going to stick with it, even though I think, yeah, the, some of the instructions are batty. Okay. Nice. Okay. Yeah. So, um, uh, again, I really like uh, what you're up to, but I, I, I'm having, I, um, I don't know much about eye language, and I, I, I need a little more help. Um, uh, so um, uh, consider an eye language instruction not to apply cat to something unless you're willing to apply animal to it, um, and compare that with the belief that uh, all cats are animals. Yeah. So um, what are the uh, uh, empirical predictions that, that on which these differ? Um, okay, um, uh, I'm not, you know, going to pretend to be able to think up good experiments on the top of, on the fly here. But um, as I see it, it's a little like the difference between somebody who <coughs> kills with indifference, okay, you know, goes to a war and, or kill, kills with indifference, and other people who kill, but they think I, I, mean, I have to have a justification for this. This is, and that's why why the person in the latter case is affected by you know some kind of you know principle in his moral faculty that says, don't go around killing people. Right? You know, I'll, I'll kill or something. But he says, yeah, that's what my moral faculty tells me, but right, I've now got, you know, I'm smarter than that, and I'm not a slave to its literal claims, and I'll justify it. So I'll feel a burden of justification, whereas somebody who wasn't, who was really amoral, said, I don't see what's the problem, right? And just kill indifferently. So there's a, a difference in the moral case. Similarly, right, there might be somebody who says, cats are, cats are a robot, so what? And they might be, as it were, completely indifferent to Gerald Katz's intuitions, and just might find them odd. Okay? Well, that's a datum. It's a datum to people. You know, it's like a datum that says some people might say, um, uh, who do you think that loves Mary? Okay? Which is, uh, you know, most American English speakers don't like, but you know, think that that has to be deleted. Uh, but I've heard that some you know, English speakers, American speakers, don't mind that. Fine. Right? There's those differences in language. That's for the linguist. Right, and the psycholinguist to determine and to isolate. And there are lots of experimental ways, I presume, in which you can figure out what are the instructions, right, that a person you know, is you know, getting from his eye language that's you know, constraining or informing his use of language. And there, I should think there are indefinite numbers of empirical ways. Who knows? And I guess Klein taught us correctly, you can get evidence from anywhere, right? Klein and Louise gave a nice example. 
<laughs> but yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay.